Hi there, my highly valued, treasured and esteemed viewers and listeners, and welcome back to your channel of choice. My name is Dr. Nath Arwa. I am a clinical pharmacist by training and by profession, and I am the founder of Progressive Pharmacotherapy Consultants, a premier virtual clinical pharmacy institute for capacity building for healthcare workers. The Virtual Clinical Pharmacy Institute with a difference, where patient safety, medication therapy management, and optimal clinical outcomes are very, very crucial and non negotiable to us. Here, we seek to remain your premier source of crucial tips for high impact pharmacotherapy services. So I humbly urge you to sit back and spare me part of your very precious time to share with you some very useful tips which may prove very handy in your line of duty. So I welcome you all to part 103 of our pharmacotherapy MCQ series, which measures in infectious diseases. Welcome. Our first question reads, which of the antibiotics listed below should be co-administered with metronidazole when treating complicated intra-abdominal infections? Is it Ceftazidim co-formulated with IV bacter, marked as AVKs, or is it Isavuconazonium, marked as Crisemba, or is it Oritavancin, marked as Obactive, or is it Tedizolid, marked as Cyvextro? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. Ceftazidim avibactam or avicas it is. Now Ceftazidim avibactam acted as avicas is a cephalosporin co-formulated with a beta lactamase inhibitor that is administered intravenously. It is indicated for complicated intra-abdominal infections in combination with metronidazole. Alternative D, Tadizolid or Cyvextro, is an oxazolidinone uh, class antibacterial agent that is indicated in adults for the treatment of acute bacterial skin and skin structure infections, abbreviated as APSSI, which is caused by susceptible bacteria, of course, and it is administered IV and orally once daily it has nothing to do with intra-abdominal infections. Then oritavancin or Bactiv, is a lipoglycopeptide antibacterial agent which is indicated in the treatment of adults with acute bacterial skin and skin structure infections caused by susceptible gram-positive microbes. It is administered intravenously only and it has nothing to do with intra-abdominal infections. And then isavuconazonium crisemba is an azole antifungal which is indicated in the treatment of invasive aspergillosis and invasive mucomycosis and it's administered both IV and orally and it has nothing to do with bacterial intra-abdominal infections. Let's move to the next question please. And it reads... Mr. CTM, a 57-year-old male patient, was admitted to your general medical ward with community-acquired pneumonia 72 hours ago to be precise. Uh, he's currently on 500 milligrams of azithromycin infused over one hour once daily alongside ampicillin sulbactam at a dose of 3 grams infused every 6 hours. He also takes cavedilol at a dose of 25 milligrams twice daily, the sinopril at a dose of 10 milligrams once a day. Some of his vitals in the past 24 hours include a temperature of 37 degrees centigrade. The heart rate has uh, varied between 70 and 85. His BP has varied between systolic 118 and 136 and diastolic 74 and 78. 
He doesn't require oxygen support and he has an arterial saturation of 92%. He is alert and oriented and this has been uh, the result on three occasions. So my question to you is, when would be the best time to oralize uh, Mr. CTM's antibiotic regimen? Would you choose to oralize his medication in 72 hours time? Would you oralize his medication tomorrow? Would you choose it to do it today or on discharge? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. I would choose to oralize this fellow today. Now the IDSA CAP guidelines state that a patient should be switched from IV to oral therapy when they are clinically and hemodynamically stable or when they are improving clinically or when they are able to ingest oral medications and have a normal functioning GIT. Remember, CTM meets this criteria and should be transitioned oral therapy today today that would be part of good antimicrobial stewardship let's move to the next question and it reads by which route are most bitter lactam antibiotics eliminated from the body is it by the fecal elimination hepatic uptake renal elimination or biliary excretion I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. Renal elimination it is. Now most bitter lactam antibiotics are secreted into the proximal convoluted tubule via mainly organic acid transporters which move drug molecules across cell membranes and thus usually require renal dose adjustments in cases of renal impairment. Just like to caution you that probenicid can increase concentrations of penicillins and other bitter lactams due to inhibition of their secretion into the proximal convoluted tubule. Now remember probenicid is also used as a uricosuric because it can also inhibit renal tubular secretion of uric acid and is a treatment option in patients with hyperuricemia with gout. Just as a by the way. Let's move to the next question please. And it reads, your clinical team is working up JNN, a 25-year-old patient for suspected CNS infection. They perform a lumbar puncture whose results are as follows. CSF opening pressure is noted to be high. The WBC is 1,250. The glucose is 25. Protein is 155 and the gram stain reveals gram negative diplococci. So, my question to you is which of the pathogens listed below is most likely the causative pathogen in this CNS infection? Is this a case of Streptococcus pneumoniae, Haemophilus influenza, Neisseria meningitis, or Staphylococcus aureus? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So this is an obvious case of Neisseria meningitis. Remember, Streptococcus pneumonia would have been reported as a gram positive diplococci not gram negative eh? 
Now, Staph aureus would have been reported as gram positive cocci, and uh, H influenza would have been reported as gram negative cocobacillus. So, remember those fine details. Just like to remind you that new Neisseria meningitis is a gram negative diplococci. The reporting of this microbe on a gram stain of the CSF should be very concerning for bacterial meningitis and it should act swiftly. Now, initial CSF findings can raise or lower suspicion of bacterial meningitis. Remember that. Now, common findings of initial CSF analysis suggestive for bacterial meningitis include, for example, high opening pressure, low glucose, high protein, and even elevated WBC results. Now, patient specific factors including age, immune status, vaccination status, uh, pre existing intracranial or interspinal devices should always be considered when determining empiric antimicrobial therapy in this cohort of patients. Now, in select patients who may have uh, CMS mass lesions or other causes of elevated intracranial pressure where LP may be delayed, uh, a distinct stain, what we call the India ink stain, can identify cryptococcal meningitis. It is, however, being replaced by what we call CRAG, cryptococcal antigen testing. So don't always be too quick to do lumbar puncture because there could be herniation of the brain. Eh? Know when to do it. Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, Dolutegravir causes a small but significant increase in risk of infant neurotube defects, what we abbreviate as NTDs, when administered at the time of conception, according to a birth surveillance study in Botswana, Africa. So my question to you is, which of the medications listed below should be used for supplementation in HIV-positive pregnant women to lower the risk of birth defects if they are treated with dolutegravir. Is it vitamin B6, B1, B9, or vitamin D? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. Folic acid or vitamin B9 is the correct answer. Now, folic acid is known to prevent NTDs in the general population. The United States Public Health Service recommends that all pregnant women and women who might conceive take at least 400 mics of folic acid on a daily basis and continue to do so throughout pregnancy. And while other vitamins listed above are undoubtedly crucial for overall general health, folic acid is the only one known to lower the risks of NTDs. Just like to add that women who are at a higher risk of having a child with NTDs than the general population are candidates for administration of high doses of folic acid, which may range anywhere between 1 milligram and 4 milligrams, or even 5 for easy dosing. Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, Mr. ITP, a 46-year-old male patient presents to your clinic the past medical history of type 2 diabetes mellitus, bipolar disorder, hypertension, he developed uh, tricuspid valve endocarditis a decade ago. He has no known drug or food allergies, and he is scheduled to undergo a dental procedure involving the manipulation of the gingival tissue. So my question to you is, which of the therapeutic options listed below would you recommend for Mr. ITP? Would it be ceftriaxone 1 gram IM stat? Would it be azithromycin 500 milligrams orally stat? Would it be amoxicillin 2 grams orally stat? Or is it true that no therapy is needed? 
I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So amoxicillin 2 grams orally start would be the best prophylactic option in this case. Remember, ITP has a history of infective endocarditis and is undergoing a procedure which requires manipulation of the gingival tissue, so prophylaxis is required and indicated. Amoxicillin is the drug of choice and should be administered 30 minutes prior to the procedure. I would like to add that azithromycin is reserved for patients with penicillin allergy. Now we, are known, we are told that this patient has no known drug or food allergies. So do not rush to choose azithromycin. And then cefriaxone can be used in patients who can't take oral prophylactic regimens. So that makes C the correct answer. Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, Mrs. SNM, a 69-year-old female, is being managed by your infectious diseases team for meningitis due to Listeria monocytogenes. She has received ampicillin for one week and is now a febrile with a normal WBC. She is clinically stable, so my question to you is for how long should ampicillin be used in SNM's treatment? Should it be for two weeks, one week, three weeks, or 10 days? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So I would treat for 21 days. Now the IDSA guidelines for bacterial meningitis state that at least 21 days of therapy is recommended for patients with meningitis due to Listeria monocytogenes. Now the seven day duration is recommended for meningitis due to Neisseria meningitis or Haemophilus, Haemophilus influenza. Then the other recommended durations include 10 to 14 days for Septococcus pneumonia, 14 to 21 days for S. agalactiae, and 21 days for anaerobic, sorry, aerobic gram-negative bacilli, just for your information. Let's move to the next question, please. The next question reads, Mr. TKK, a 64-year-old male patient, has been admitted to your medical ICU for the past three days. Today, he is in respiratory distress. He has no known drug or food allergies, and his vitals include a body temperature of 38.7 degrees centigrade, a heart rate of 112, and a respiratory rate of 30. So my question to you is, within what time frame should the clinical team initiate antibiotics in TKK's treatment? Should it be within six hours, three hours, one hour, or two hours? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. It should be within an hour. Now the surviving sepsis and septic shock guidelines recommend the administration of a broad spectrum intravenous antimicrobial for all likely pathogens within one hour of sepsis recognition. However, a meta-analysis found no significant mortality benefit between antibiotics administered within one versus three hours. Regardless, most clinicians agree that early administration of antibiotics is important in the overall management of sepsis. Now, for patients with sepsis-induced hypoperfusion, 
We should provide 30 ml per kilo of IV crystalloid within three hours. Now, microbiologic cultures should in such scenarios be taken before the antimicrobials are administered when feasible. And that helps optimize the likelihood of isolating the pathogen in culture. Now, this allows the empiric antibiotics to be narrowed in their spectrum of coverage to the targeted organisms once the lab results are released by the microbiology lab or department. So work closely with your microbiologist for optimal management of such patients. Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, Mr. HKL, 44-year-old male HIV seropositive patient, has been taking a new protease inhibitor-based HAART regimen. Today, he presents to the HIV Comprehensive Care Clinic with complaints that his skin recently began turning yellow or golden in appearance. Today, it's mildly itches. Now, the clinical team is concerned he has developed jaundice. So my question to you is, which of the protease inhibitors listed below is well known to cause isolated hyperbilirubinemia or mild jaundice without any hepatocellular damage which can lead to a similar presentation such as this one of Mr. HKL? Is it abecavir, zygen? Is it favidens, sustiva? Or is it etazanavir, reatas? Or is it the combination of lopinavir, ritonavir, which is marketed as eluvia? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. Atazanavir reatas it is. Now, atazanavir is a protease inhibitor used for the treatment of HIV infection that is known to cause isolated elevation in bilirubin because of its ability to inhibit glucuronidation of bilirubin via what we call the UGT1A1 enzyme system. Now, I'd like to add that favirenz is an NNRTI that is used in the treatment of HIV infection. It is associated with the, the risk of worsening psychiatric conditions. And then aluvia, lupinavia, ritonavia, is a PI that is used in the treatment of HIV infection that causes dyslipidemia and hyperglycemia, but not usually uh, isolated elevations of bilirubin. Now, I'd just like to mention that abacavir zygen is an NRTI which is used in patients with HLAP star 57 allele negative patients. For those that are positive, it can cause hypersensitivity reactions which can be very severe and fatal. I would just like to mention that UGT is the enzyme needed to conjugate bilirubin for increased renal elimination. Now, when this enzyme is inhibited, the bilirubin remains unconjugated and more likely to deposit into the skin, thereby causing the mild jaundice and even the itching that this patient is complaining about. Now, atazanavir is dosed once daily and should be separated from antacids if we are to get or achieve maximum absorption. That's just a, by the way. Let's move to the next question, please. The next question reads, Mr. PKO, a 59-year-old male patient who was involved in a motor vehicle accident, was admitted to a surgical intensive care unit two weeks ago. The clinical team performed a qualitative bronchoalveolar lavage, BAL, and the culture returned with 100,000 
colony forming units of acinetobacter bound money. The corresponding antibacterial sensitivity data are pending. So my question to you is, which of the antibiotics listed below would be the most appropriate empiric choice in Mr. PKO's clinical scenario now now? Would you opt to infuse meropenem, imipenem, silastatin, metapenem, or doripenem? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. would choose to infuse imipenem silastatin. Now remember, etapenem should never be used in infections caused by acinetobacter bound money since almost 30% of isolates are susceptible. The rest are resistant. Now doripenem, marketed as doripex and meropenem, are considered alternate options due to being less potent in in vitro against acinetobacter baumani as compared to imipenem silastatin. Now, in addition, imipenem silastatin is considered a carbapenem of choice since the predominance of literature addressing the treatment of acinetobacter baumani infections utilizes imipenem silastatin. So I would settle for imipenem silastatin for that reason. Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, Mrs. HKM, a 36-year-old female patient, presents to your clinic the chief complaint of increased urinary frequency, painful urination, which has occurred for the past 48 hours. On physical examination, she is found to have a mild right-sided costovertebral Ango CVA tenderness. The infectious diseases consultant in the team suspects she has early pyelonephritis. Mrs. HKM hasn't had any antimicrobials in the past one year and she has no known drug or food allergies. So, my question to you is which of the therapeutic options listed below would be the most appropriate for Mrs. HKM now now Would you choose to use nitrofurantoin, phosphomycin, cotrimoxazole or amoxicillin? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. I would settle for cotrimoxazole. Now, the IDSA guidelines for uncomplicated cystitis and pyelonephritis state that amoxicillin or ampicillin should not be used for empiric treatment due to poor efficacy. Then it adds that phosphomycin and nitrofurantoin should be avoided in cases where early pyelonephritis is suspected due to insufficient penetration and efficacy in infections involving the renal parenchyma. Now, phosphomycin, I would just like to add, is the only single-dose regimen recommended by the IDSA for uncomplicated cystitis in women. Now, cystitis, remember, only involves the bladder, so because of all those penny words, cotrimoxazole would be the best option in this particular clinical scenario. Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, Mr. MTW, a 40-year-old male patient, presents to your accident and emergency department with a soft tissue infection. The infectious diseases consultant on duty suspects it was caused by a community-acquired methicillin-resistant staph aureus. Assuming 
he will be managed as an outpatient. Which of the therapeutic options listed below would be the most appropriate for Mr. MTW? Would it be tigercycline, levofloxacin, cotrimoxazole, or coamoxiclav? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. Cotrimoxazole would be the best choice here. Now, both cotrimoxazole and tigercycline can be used in the treatment of MRSA. However, tigercycline is typically reserved for hospitalized or hospital acquired or more resistant MRSA and is only available in the intravenous drug form, which is suitable for hospitalized patients and it would be less desirable for an outpatient. Now, tiger cycling is reserved for patients in the inpatient hospital setting or it can also be administered in a home health care system. Now, cotrimoxazole is available in oral form and would therefore be ideal for this patient. I would like to add that neither coamoxiclav nor levofloxacin covers MRSA. Now, community acquired MRSA is in the same as hospital acquired MRSA, they have different antibiotic considerations. So remember that, I would refer you to the IDSA guidelines. Now, commonly used oral agents that cover community acquired MRSA include clindamycin, cleosin or dalacin, doxycycline, which is marketed as vibramycin, linezolid, which is marketed as zyvox, minocycline, marketed as minocin, Tedizolid, acted as Cyvextro, or Cotrimoxazole, Cotrimoxazole, sorry, for the sleep, acted as Bactrim or Septrin. So there you have it, my highly esteemed viewers and listeners. That brings us to the end of this video. If this video benefited you in any way, I would like to humbly urge you to please give it a thumbs up, to like it and to share it widely with your peers and to leave your comment at the bottom. And if you haven't yet done so, I humbly urge you to subscribe to my YouTube channel. I would like to promise you all that the very, very best is yet to come. Thank you very much for viewing this video and for listening to me. I sincerely appreciate your partnership and your continued support and very kind collaboration. And I look forward to interacting with you in the next video. Thank you very much.